Hi, everybody. Welcome to the August edition of the All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. Today we have uh, Dr. Rudy Packenbaba. He's an Alabama Extension Specialist, Plant Physiologist with Alabama A&M University. And today he will talk about GMOs and their effect on insect populations. Uh, not just resources, but better types of crops and qualities and traits in these plants for our particular consumption. And so um, from the very onset of agriculture where we um, crossing and selecting plants, we were um, dabbling with the genetic code. So one of the biggest things that um, scientists and um, those in agriculture have been realizing is a new technology which hasn't been really new for uh, science in general. It's a uh, hearing. And um, the genetic engineering has been with us for quite some time since the early 70s, um, especially in the medical field. Um, 80s and 90s, we really started more with the agriculture area. But, um, you know, agriculture scientists started uh, really utilizing this technology because, um, as the quote says on the screen, agriculture is staying ahead of Mother Nature. And nature um, can throw um, a lot of different curves to us. And we're just trying to make sure that we can ensure a healthy food supply and a safe food supply. And as far as the producers are concerned, you know, we want to give them good tools to grow their crops and uh, food productively while on. Products, not just for themselves, but also for consumers. So bioengineering, which is also another name for genetic engineering, is, um, is a tool, as I mentioned before. tools that scientists utilize um, to modify and introduce new traits. So um, it doesn't really mean that they're bioengineered. So there are other particular tools out there such as crossbreeding and hybrid that actually is uh, referred to as genetically modified. But um, so the term it's is a very broad um, term that I think most of us in agriculture and kind of frown upon because it really doesn't define accurately what the technology really looking at for regulation and also um, the incorporation of new DNA, which is bioengineering. So just to dive in and to try and explain, um, you know, what on the grocery shelves and so forth, uh, we see a lot of labels out there with uh, regard to available and only a small fraction of those really impart any type of insect resistance. Um, out of the 10, I think probably about three out of the 10 are actually having corn and soybean. Uh, they have an insect resistance uh, and, and they're incorporated into their genome. Uh, also cotton as well. Then there's also potatoes. So really cotton and soybean and corn are really the ones that are the ones that are out there that have that particular insect and are targeting particular type of insects uh, that are attacking the actual crop. We have squash as well. Ramaya is also genetically modified. Canola, uh, alfalfa, and the newer ones that are out there. I don't know if there are maybe some in the Midwest and the Northwest United States in the Arctic apple. Um, I'm still kind of waiting for it down here in the south, so um, really to try and try the uh, new Arctic apple, but I've heard some great things about it. I know that the industry is also trying to incorporate the, that same type of technology, I think, into the Honeycrisp apple, so it works out. Um, sugar beets is also another one. I think most people are not really aware. 49% of our industry in sugar, our sugar actually comes from sugar beets and not sugar cane. Eggplant is one of these crops that is not available in the United States, but is available internationally, and that's in the um, uh, Bangladesh area. This actually has insect resistance, and it's, it's actually helped and made great strides for their economy and farmers there because they've chosen to adopt the actual um, genetically modified eggplant because of their root borers out there that's um, really causing a really big concern because 
cells have been over reliant on uh, pesticides and chemical control where it, safety training and also um, safety equipment um, they're having issues because of utilizing such large quantities of the pesticides so um, I think that um, they uh, the country themselves and internationally accepted the utilization of the genetically modified um, eggplant so um, just about bioengineered crops, uh, there has been a study back in 2016 that kind of all the the years past of uh, research and also current research with the use of bioengineered crops. Um, it is available online. It's a it's a it's a large years to accomplish. Published in 2016, and um, the National Academy of Sciences actual research group. Uh, of scientists and also um, individuals that um, participated in the actual study itself to look over the research. I think over 1,700 different um, determined that uh, the biogenic crops were safe as conventionally grown counterparts. Let's talk a little bit about natural pest protection um, and, and what is being used in these um, genetically modified crops. Um, a lot of folks know it as a BT by a bacteria that is found in the soil. That bacteria is known as Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, it's a very type of a protein, also known in the industry as a bacterial insecticidal protein. Um, there's a number of different insecticidal proteins now that are available that have um, been derived from insects, um, and uh, they target a specific type of insect or um, um, pillars and moths, uh, particularly in the, the crops that are being protected. They're, they're very specific in, in mode of action. Uh, and that's why the, the, the scientists were really interested in this. And um, it's been known, actually, Bacillus thuringiensis has been known for several years in the culture industry because it's been used since the 1950s um, as just kind of a, a, a dust or a, a use. Interesting enough, it was registered actually the, the use of this pest protection in the, with the EPA in the 1960s, 1961. To date, the um, insect protection that is incorporated into um, bioengineered has been predominantly conferred by these particular uh, proteins derived from bacillus. Right now, um, there's about over 180 different that are BT type products. Um, they range from different types of sprays, dusts, and also pellets. Um, and most, it's not, I would say most, but some of them are actually organic production. Um, there are chemicals that are approved for organic production. I think also a, a misconception um, uh, for most um, consumers that, um, things that are uh, organically produced that they are pesticide. Allowed under certain type of guidelines. Um, and in this particular case, if they come under those guidelines and they're on an approved list, then those particular chemicals can be used or chemical free. It's just that they have to be approved under certain type of standards. Um, and unfortunately, some of these chemicals are actually more caustic uh, and require a little bit more handling, careful handling, than your actual conventional chemicals. So that's something to kind of keep in, uh, um, in mind. But um, with the incorporation of these particular genes that the bacteria produces, these uh, chemical um, crystalline, we have them engineered into actual crops. And that's where um, the actual toxin used within the actual crop itself. And these are referred to as plant incorporated protectants. Um, these insecticidal proteins that are derived from BT 
um, right now are available in cotton. Soybean, which controls the actual caterpillar pests, and also in maize, uh, which is corn. So has a contained um, variation of the Bt toxin trade for caterpillar um, control. Um, and it's it's been around. It just hasn't been approved. It's been uh, uh, produced back in 2014, but uh, because of regulations uh, and testing, uh, produced in small areas for farmers to test, and uh, officially in 2018, uh, those were um, um, accepted. Okay, so some of the uh, by utilizing these types of um, proteins, um, the in uh, genetic engineering and, and bioengineering, it started as, uh, you know, targeting a specific type of, of pest. And now because we've uh, learned different variations of this particular chemical and crystal, uh, protein crystal, that you can target other types of pests within that same family. And so now we have um, a progression from single type of you look at and target one particular pest, but we can target multiple pests, maybe up to two pests. So we have different modes of action. Um, so we have uh, from insect protection traits, not only from BTs, but also from other types of technology. We have a new technology called RNAi or RNA. Um, um, in and uh, this is an actual, also another protein that is uh, introduced and produced by the plant. It binds to the gut um, and then kills it off, um, makes it sick, and then actually, you know, they, they, they starve to death. Uh, and then there are also other um, that I've heard of. I've not really looked into it uh, recently, but they're, they're also non bt control. One of the biggest ones is the reduction of the use of um, the uh, less effective and less environmentally friendly insecticides. But one of the biggest things about um, the specific, so they're called broad spectrum. And unfortunately, because of that, um, you're not just killing what you are targeting, you may be also killing off and affecting other types of insects out there that are deemed, you know, beneficials and they're very hard to control since they're non-selective um, it and environmentally uh, managing your pest control um, so that leads into high specificity towards pests uh, one of the biggest things that um, the GMO um, pest that is targeting that plant or that particular crop um, we can actually target. And that's that's the big specificity plus to utilizing this type of technology. Um, and also it allows for a better uh, pest management strategy for growers. Um, the utilization of crops that have protection built in is not just a kind of a silver bullet. It's something that is incorporated management plan that farmers integrate into their farming practices. And we'll talk a little bit about it. So um, these management practices are, are there because of challenges in utilizing GMO technology and um, pest integration into the plants is um, the utilization of this technology, sustainability, and obviously the evolution of resistance. And so uh, I know there are lots of questions and, and, and type of GMO or BT crop and yes it does happen um, and that's and that comes from the fact that there is in some cases when where there was initially introduced in some countries there was the large over on utilizing just the BT crops uh, without an appropriate management system
started seeing some of that resistance occurring in different countries to different types of borms. And um, part of that was because um, they didn't have a resistance map. So a lot of times now in, in countries, there is a utilization of RAM practices or integrated pest management practices that are, have to be integrated with utilization of these BT crops. So IRM, which is also known as Insect Resistant Management Program, are always implemented with um, the utilization of certain types of bioengineered or bee. Um, and that has led to a growing number of, um, you know, we can actually control the actual currents of pest resistance. So um, the, the programs have been implemented wherever BT crops have been commercially um, adopted countries and, and and in some countries such as the united states canada uh european Europeans and south africa these programs of irm are actually mandatory and you know they get training and they also uh they they monitor these particular sites to these um, resistant management practices to help control and maybe stave off the evolution in these particular crops so the use of BD crops with an integrated management program is essential to prevent or sometimes delay the risk of insecticidal resistance. And the thing that I want to talk about, which is I think most people are not aware of, is that part of that she hinged on a, uh, a program that's called refuge areas or plots. Um, and it's a very simple concept, um, and um, it actually is utilized uh, quite prominently. What is a refuge? It is a basically an area of non-bioengineered crops that do not have any pest resistance. And that area is going to be planted either within Um, a crop itself or in adjacent area next to it. So what it really is implying is that a refuge is an area non-BT crops that has been planted to produce what we call susceptible insects that have not been introduced to the BT toxin can then now um, mate resistant um, pests that come out of the actual BT crop area that are not being affected by the BT uh, protein and they have this resistance that insect then what we would have is the perpetuation of that resistance to the actual offspring of the actual pest. and so the integration of the refuge crop with those non-resistant out of that field will help stop that um, and so you're breaking that cycle aspect uh, that you want to produce insects from this particular area that um, with this technology of bioengineering um, companies also um, universities have uh, incorporated programs that help farm and, and also implement these particular practices such as the refuge practice which is in where we integrate non-bt type crops to help control the occurrence produces um, in from the refuge area um, means that these particular insects have not been to the actual protein um, and uh, these proteins are therefore um, not going or not going to actually encourage that type of resistance. So we have one question, what agency regulates these requirements? It's going to be the USDA. USDA helps looks at these particular requirements. Um, and practices are in place when people utilize these particular crops. Good question. Goal is to produce susceptible insects, um, and, and 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 if you really think about it, in the first uh, utilization of BT crops, you're thinking, well, so you want me to produce? It's kind of counterintuitive when you first 
you want me to produce actual insects that are not resistant. Well, that's the whole point because we want stop that cycle the cycle which then resistance occurs we want to prevent that from occurring so you have to have insects insects that are actually normal that have not been exposed to those proteins to actually continue actual normal cycle of the actual pest itself so as a result insects are more likely to mate with susceptible insects that were produced by the refuge so perpetuation of the um, resistant uh, gene uh, that has occurred in those actual pests. So uh, as I mentioned before, pests from the refuge plot can help break. And when you actually buy seed, you hear in this, in this image here, it'll actually give you recommendations uh, from the actual to tell you what the ratio is, the appropriate ratio to plant um, a non corn or let's say crop within your field and you can see there's a 20 percent there and that'll actual grower or producer that they need that rate of 20 percent at least 20 percent um, bt or non-engineered crop to be integrated or placed in proximity to the um, gmo crop um, oh thanks tim just made a, a a, a comment on uh, answering that particular um, question about the is it is the EPA um, that helps monitor that. Uh, thanks, Tim. And uh, things that uh, I wanted to kind of show about how farmers plant uh, some of these GMO crops. We call a structural refuge uh, application. Um, we have a block refuge where the non-BT uh, type crop, which is in bands within the actual field of the BT corn. We also have a strip refuge. I've used a strip before in planting some of our sweet corn. Uh, so there's one where we look at a pivotal corner refuge. Not really effective because um, you want, when, when you want, what you really want is you want to make sure that uh, the, the res The actual um, pests that are non-resistant. So if they're in these corners, they're not going to have immediate access to any type of mating and crossing. So you don't get really good coverage with that as well. Actually utilized quite a bit um, and I've, I've purchased seed in this fashion as well. It's called the huge uh, type of plan uh, and that's where the seed is actually mixed. BT um, type seed, and so you've got BT and non-BT seeds that are incorporated non-BT corn or crop integrated within the actual field. And this is called the refuge in a bag type products or RAB. Um, and you can purchase them from most companies that way. Type of resistance that may come out of your field from pests. Uh, typically, um, I've seen most of the times it's about a 5% rate on these particular seeds. Um, and so the refuge plants within the field are going to randomly throughout the entire field to help kind of control the evolution of this resistance um, that are in the actual bug. So this is one particular tool that uh, farmers utilize to help control the populations of these particular bugs that are that may have some resistance to the actual uh, yeah, toxin. But overall, um, you know, the, the science has shown that BT for And when I mean pest populations, those are those targeted pests that you're actually looking at. Overall broad spectrum of beneficial pests as well, or bugs, where if you were to utilize the actual um, insecticides, you would probably be then in that area. So it actually helps increase insect diversity because since you're looking at a high specificity of targeting a particular type of pest, then you're not there. So um, one of the recommendations that uh, the uh, National Academy of Sciences had mentioned is that when used properly, these particular types of technology of crops 
are good for farmers and good for the environment. And also, the is also safe for humans as well. Um, some of the resources that I've used in the past, Pesticide Information Center, there's also the USDA um, disclosure area, bioengineered food disclosure standards, which is now talking about the labeling of GMO food. Useful out of University of Nebraska, uh, and also a, a, a new uh, publication that was uh, published in 2019, which was actually really, really good, and it came, kind of gave a, gave a uh, of all the things that had been happening, uh, a good summary of all the technology when referring to um, utilization of integrated pest management and also pest uh, in, in, in GMO crops. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I'm actually um, open. Do any of you guys have any questions you would like to ask? Dr. Packenbaba, we did have one earlier about the use of uh, BT or RNA insecticides. And when we use those, which attack the caterpillars, have we seen a reduction in populations of other Lepidoptera that may be reducing the pollination of other plants? Can you say that again? Phase that, Danny, I'm sorry. Using BT insecticides or some of these types of insecticides which target caterpillar pests, have you found that they have reduced populations of other Lepidopterus, which might reduce pollination of other plants. Um, you know, from what I've seen, there has been. Um, I may not be completely well versed with all types of uh, caterpillars that is affecting. Um, I'm not sure if Tim or or Vicky. Physicity the actual types of caterpillars that are infecting in, let's say in these monocrop areas are very specific so um the the pollen that is actually being integrated in some other areas of those particular um uh caterpillars yeah and there's a study from washington state uh study there's an article from washington state that dr linda chalker scott wrote in 2008 is that there's actually few reports of BT lethality upon non-target organisms feeding caterpillars. Um, and so it's, it's pretty specific. Crops that are being applied. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Vicki. And, and, and I think um, what kind of perpetuates um, the, the, the added, um, initial study by Cornell that um, kind of prompted the, the big concern, especially with monarch butterflies. And uh, it comes up periodically uh, online and in blogs about, um, you know, cat other types of insects. And um, there is an actual website the USDA put out um, and then talked about, you know, the implications of BT on, you know, specific butterflies. And, and, and the key thing is, uh, like Vicky said, Specific and um, in the case for the monarch butterflies, they determined that yes, milkweed um, weeds that were within the actual area of the corn. Um, had nothing else to eat besides that particular pollen, and so um, and and at the rate at which you actually find the pollen within the field, it's not lethal or it does not divert uh, any uh, detrimental effects to the actual caterpillar. But under those closed and in control conditions, they actually increase the rate of exposure to the actual caterpillar, thereby it was almost a thousand parts uh, or, or, yeah, I think it was a thousand um, grams or a thousand parts. They, uh, the EPA found and also USDA found that it was just actually less than that, maybe 10 to 15 or 
um, or 70 around there that was actually detrimental to those um, caterpillars. It was actually had to be about a thousand and that's where they were actually forcing, force feeding these caterpillars at that, that rate. Um, see what sweet corn is grown with BT protection. Um, Right now, I don't think there's a very quantity. Uh, the majority of, of uh, BT corn is actually going to be utilized uh, processed food industry and also uh, the actual um, animal feeding. Uh, right now, um, there are some varieties out there, um, such as Temptation, uh, Obsession, some other ones that are being worked on that are actually um, BT protected, the sweet corns as, as well, but field corns, most of the actual BT protected uh, corn are going to be uh, your field corns. Okay, okay. Thanks, Vicki. The uh, sweet corn right now? Um, it just is, um, it just says corn. Okay. Okay. I'm looking at USDA website and it just says corn. Yeah, um, and, and and that that's pretty accurate as far as old corn varieties. Yeah, it um, says domestic BT corn. Okay. It doesn't specify. Let's see. Is such sweet corn classified as organic? Um, no, uh, the organic label that is uh, authorized by the USDA certified USDA not allow the utilization of a GMO or bioengineered uh, seed. So that's sweet corn that is actually imparting um, uh, any type uh, is not going to be classified as organic. Um, the, the nice thing is like they are originally uh, conventional type hybrids um, and so there are two designations, let's say, for obsession and, and uh, temptation. There's a temptation one. Nation is the, the bioengineered version. The original version is still going to be conventional hybrids. And there's a couple other questions there. Uh, why are European countries banned? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's not just um, all in countries, there, there are other ones that I'm familiar with that uh, are heavy adopted and some of those, most of that is going to be through, um, from what I experienced, looking at um, considering them, uh, they haven't gone through their testing as well because each country has to go through their own testing. Uh, and to look at things that everybody else has. Um, and so there, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, working through that particular process. Okay, if the BT corn is fed to animals and we eat the animals, is of biomagnification that is similar to mercury or seafood? That's a good question. Um, for these particular chemicals, let's say for like mercury, um, there are cells in our body that can bio It is a protein. And so with all proteins, when they're ingested first by the animals, um, they are going to be degraded down to their basic structure of amino acids. is going to be reutilized by our bodies. So they become inert. Um, same thing happens if it were to be, um, you know, ingested by humans. And um, it would that BT or bioengineered crop that is um, animal. Okay. Um, let's see, if a beneficial insect devours an insect that is comprised 
by be a uh, compromise insect you know i'm not quite sure um i'm not had not quite sure on that answer um i don't know well, one thing you have to look at and understand is you know the psilocyringensis or vt it impacts certain types of insects uh it doesn't impact every insect it's really it's mostly lepidopterans and and some aquatic different are impacted by that so if a if a predatory insect like a, you know, a caterpillar that has had ET in it, it doesn't impact it at all. And it has to do with chemistry in the gut of the insects. Uh, so that's another reason why BTs are uh, and it really helps you uh, avoid impacting non-targets and any has a certain less than some of the things we used to use like synthetic pyrethroids or phosphates. Uh, so uh, that's really the advantage to it is that it's not to insects, it's specific to certain types of insects. Yeah. You know, the mode of action that I think um, when when we talk about uh, those, those of industry and in science, we talk about insecticidal proteins or just you know a toxin. Um, there's this consensus that you know the toxin is going to be poisonous to everything, and that's a good point that Tim had pointed out. The gut in the actual worm, so unless you're talking about that same type of worm, all the other insects that uh, may come in contact with this toxin um, will not um, and thereby, you know, killing that. So it's, it's very specific as Tim had mentioned, and that's one of the biggest advantages to utilizing this particular type of um, pest resistance. Uh, Okay, any other questions am I missing? This has been really productive, it's been great. Great interaction with everybody. Really has, these are great questions. Y'all think of a question and I'm gonna go ahead and throw up yeah, that. Um, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Rudy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see, I was gonna put that last slide. There's that last slide that uh, I needed to put up. Oh, I gotta get ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, good way, Tim. <laughs> Dr. Davis, that is your friendly reminder. I better put that on my. <laughs> Everybody, I have um, put up a, a poll if you wouldn't mind with that, and we appreciate you all being here today. Dr. Packenbaba, thank you so much. That was awesome. We appreciate that information. Oh, I mean, oh, I should put that back up. Sorry. No, it's okay. There we go. I was seeing if anyone had any other questions. I did see one about BT exposure and honeybees, but we do know it's not going to, you kind of answered that when you were talking about different kinds of Lepidoptera not being affected by the, or different insects in the same strain. So I'm done about that very, too. Very specific. Yeah. So you guys, if you, well, as soon as I said that, what about BT and bagworms? Is there a what about bagworms? Oh, um, I'm not, I don't think it affects bagworms at all. Tim? Yeah. No, uh, bagworms, normally you're going to have to use, and they're actually kind of hard to deal with because they, they have that silken cocoon. Yeah. So. That lepidopter or that caterpillar inside that bag is really kind of the, diff the most difficult thing. Um, so a lot of what we look at, you know, there's a reason why we tell people not to plant Leylands anymore. <laughs> um, you know, homeowner-wise, a lot of the one of the few things available is those those bags. The reality is, by the time most people realize they have a problem with that, it's too late. 
Yeah, that's true. That's why monitoring is so important. Okay, you guys, if there are no more questions, again, Dr. Pack and Baba, thank you so much. And Dr. Tim Davis, Tag, you're it. We'll see you next month for Fire Ants in the Landscape. All right. You thank guys you. have a great August. We'll see you in September. All right. Thank you.